Welcome everyone. I'm Clyde Wilcox, the interim dean here at Georgetown University, Petra. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion. This discussion is the eighth event uh, in, in, uh, under the FIFA World Cup 2022 lecture series, which in turn is part of a larger series research initiative, Building a Legacy under FIFA World Cup 2022. This ongoing initiative was launched by Sears in 2020 to provide a platform for academic research of the upcoming FIFA World Cup Cutter 2022. The project is being led by Dr. Daniel Reich, who is a visiting research fellow at Sears. Dr. Reich joined Georgetown University Cutter in the summer of 2020. Before that, he was Associate Professor of Comparative Politics at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. His publications that are relevant for this panel include co-edited volumes titled Petter and 2022, FIFA World Cup Politics, Controversy and Change of Paul Gray and Paul Dillon, Handbook of Sports in the Middle East from Rutledge, and Sport, Politics and Society in the Middle East from Hearst Oxford University Press. I'll now hand it over to Daniel who will introduce the panel. Thank you, Clyde. Um, and thank you everybody for coming. Uh, three hours ago, I posted a picture on Twitter with an empty room. I'm glad to fit in the meantime. <laughs> and this is event number eight in our Web Club Lecture Series, as, as uh, Dean Wilcox mentioned, and it's the first in person event. So all other events have been online. And you can also watch them if you want uh, on our website or on YouTube. Um, regarding Tonight's topic, uh, when we think about Qatari's sporting successes, we might first think about the national football team's win of the AFC Asian Cup 2019 for the three Qatari medals at the Tokyo Olympics in summer 2021, or Mutas Barshan's recent win of the high jumping competition at the World Athletic Championship. What all of these successes have in common is that they were by male athletes. The promotion of women's sport received lots of governmental support in recent years. However, this effort did not start with the awarding of the FIFA World Cup 2022 to Qatar in December 2010. The Qatar Women's Sports Committee was already established in 2001. While the female lay ratio of registered athletes in Qatari Sports Federations is, according to the Ministry of Planning and Statistics, at 1 to 10, and cultural obstacles for women's sports in Qatar may persist, much progress has been made in only a few years. In 2012, for the first time, we've seen a Qatari woman participating in the Summer Olympic Games. Women's sports were in May of this year for the first time included in the GCC Games. They were last year two Qatari women, one of them our Qatar Foundation CEO, who completed a triathlon. And in 2018 and 2019, the Qatari National Women's Rugby Team won the West Asian Championship, a case I have discussed in recent publication. When it comes to women's rights, there has been gradual change. Since January 2020, Qatari women no longer need a male guardian's permission to obtain a driving license. The lived experience of women in Qatar is that they are increasingly entering spaces in education and the labor market. For example, one of the stars of the government is Lola al Qatar, the assistant foreign minister. Georgetown University in Qatar admitted 123 new students at the beginning of this academic year, 70% of them being women. Now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our guests. To keep this introduction short, I will briefly introduce our speakers before they make their approximately five minute long contribution. After the three introductory remarks, we will open the Q&A. A few housekeeping points before we start. First, please turn off your mobile phones or keep them silent. Let me check mine. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's silent. Yeah. Uh, second, sign up to be on our events mailing list on the reception desk. Third, please use your tweets related to this event, our hashtag CS2022. And finally, after the discussion, there will be a reception and we welcome you all to join us. Our first speaker is Afra al -Mani. Afra, you are the Executive Director of Yosua Institute, the education and training arm of the Supreme Committee for Delivery in Legacy. Could you share with us 
To what extent did your work empower women in the country? How is the interest of women in your professional diploma programs in sport management and major events, but also in the volunteering program for the web? First of all, thank you for having me. I'm Sam Aikum. Good evening, everyone. Sorry. Uh, the Sur Institute is one of the legacy projects that is created by the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, and our aim is to create a lasting legacy that goes beyond the one week, uh, one month of football. Our legacy is basically to train our skating in capital and also to create a model that is relevant to the sports and event industry here in the if we take a step back, the uh, Institute is one of the legacy projects. That means that Father's agenda is to create uh, or to use the opportunity of hosting such a major event, the first out of people work up, to create a change. And that change is, it can see, as you said, in different uh, industries, not only in sports. So we have the, uh, the hard change, which is basically infrastructure, the technical readiness for any hosting country, and we also have the soft change, which is basically the human capital relevance, the knowledge, uh, creation of knowledge that is relevant uh, to the MENA region, and the national branding, and also the role of women in sports and event industry and other relevant industries. And that change is not only in Qatar, but also in the MENA region. And that only comes from this major uh, culture event, such as the FIFA World Cup and other Olympic uh, and Olympic sports events. Dr. Zaka Pavis Abdullah sagt, you earned a PhD at Durham University from the Department of Government and International Affairs with a focus on gender studies. And you are teaching classes at both Georgetown University and Northwestern University, both teams are here. When looking beyond sports, how has the situation for women changed in Qatar since the country has been awarded the FIFA World Cup 2022 in December 2010? You recently published a paper on women workforce participation in Qatar. Could you share with us some insights in your research, but also comment in general on changes in the lived experience of women in Qatar? Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm talking about the reviews, and here I feel any pressure anymore. Um, I would like to. I would like to start by first of all problematizing the words in Parliament. Um, and I think language is very important because it, it really informs our perception of women's rights. So I think that the idea that we're giving power to someone really forces hierarchies, and specifically when it comes to this region that is all, very often being seen from a very orientalist or even our new colonial lens. Um, and so I think it's good that we start unpacking and reconstructing um, uh, women's empowerment in relation to, to FIBA. Uh, and the politics of sport and Korean identity. I will not go into details on this, you can, we can talk about this later. So, uh, you know, it's in this context that I want to talk a little bit about uh, women's rights and women's position uh, in Qatar uh, and the narrative that has been created since the country won the bid in 2022. Um, and so, you know, and, and, and uh, the reports that have come out, numerous reports talking about women's rights issues. And so just like, you know, how human rights um, can be seen from a more superiority lens of certain institutions from a Eurocentric lens, I think similar can happen to women's rights that, that is often essentialized from this lens of us versus them. Um, again, not now I'm talk about the reports, we can talk about that later, but um, talking about women's rights, so a women's position in this society. Um, not that, I'm not saying that there are no issues, but like, first of all, we to be what do we mean by women? Um, I think it's very problematic that even now, in that in today's time, the knowledge that we have in intersectionality, we still look at women as one category. A woman is not just her gender. Uh, you know, the idea that a woman has multiple identities that create different forms of discrimination and suffering. So I think uh, a lot of these reports kind of miss. The, you know, the contextual, the, the, uh, the, the social political um, context of women's rights in the Gulf. Um, so having said that, I think a lot of changes have happened in the past decade since, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the bid was won. Uh, uh, some positive changes have indeed happened, but I don't think they're all either related to FIFA or because of FIFA. 
Um, for example, also women's increased participation on labor forms, women's increased uh, roles in political leadership, uh, etc. I think this is not just because of FIFA, but a, a just a natural consequence of you know changing trends in society, such as women's increased education rates, women's uh, you know, changes in the workforce demands, the changes in the national agenda, etc. And if you look at the national vision, the first version that came out way before FIFA in 2009 had a whole section on women. So I think this was an intended consequence of a change in national culture. Um, now other things I think are related to FIFA, for example, you know, after FIFA, the country adopted the national sport and culture, starting with the National Sports Day. This, of course, I think has led to women's increased um, appearance in sports venues, and it has given them new forms of agency, etc. But I think it isn't the same for men as well. So I don't think that, um, you know, women's increased appearance in sport is necessarily means a women's empowerment. It's just um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a consequence of changes in, in the national culture. Uh, and um, I think what we have to understand is that sports is, was imagined or lived very differently in this part of the world. You have to look at the colonial legacies. Um, the idea that things like football and stuff, these, were, these are not commonly played here, but these were not all sports that people played. Uh, and so I think that um, the idea of having a new national culture of sports, I think, has led to different realities, different, um, you know, uh, perceptions of people towards sports, including women. Um, and I will, so I, I think it's, it's quite, the issue is not as simple as, you know, having the more female figures in sports equals women's empowerment. I'm going to end with this. I know I took more than my time, but I know. Um, I will end by saying I think it's quite problematic when a lot of these reports are painting a very black and white picture of women's rights in the region, like this moral policy, like, you know, because they, are, they haven't implemented these changes, so we should bycott them. Um, my fear is that, you know, gender equality is far from complete anywhere in the world. So I think this, this narrative of social change vis-a-vis -vis FIFA is, is harming women's a position in the society, it will at best lead to tokenist change or reforms that are either not complete uh, or that will, you know, things that need time to change. Uh, and I think this will at best lead women as tools for national progress and women's empowerment. Thank you. Uh, Susan, you are an associate professor in the communication program at our neighboring university, Northwestern University in Qatar. You have published about the importance of role models to increase sporting participation amongst Qatari women. Apart from male celebrities such as David Beckham, the World Cup Organizing Committee appointed recently Nadia Nadi, an Afghanistan born woman who represents Denmark in international football as a World Cup ambassador. Do you think that this can inspire local girls? To play football and practice other sports, or did you identify and your research other factors that matter? Thank you, Daniel, and assalamu alaikum. It's nice to see everybody here, and it's an honor to be on the panel with these two esteemed women. So I can't agree more with what has been said before me, and I think that one of the things that's really important to recognize is that there's a there's the level of what's happening at a governmental level and an institutional level, but there's also the question in a young woman, a young girl's mind, what makes her want to be somebody who participates in sport? And there's a lot of influences on that decision. One of them that's very important are role models. So young women, and this is also true for young men, but our topic here is, is women, so I'm not trying to uh, say that this is something that only happens for us women, but for a young person who wants to get interested or who may become interested in sport, many things influence them. One of them is looking up and seeing people that inspire them. And so role models are one of those things. But those role models don't necessarily have to be people who do the same activity. So for example, Sheikh Almosa is extremely influential here in Pulper of, of across a variety of areas, not just in, say, governance, which is the kind of thing that she does. So the research that I did on role models here, obviously I'm an outsider here. I have been here since 2008, and I'm really excited about seeing the firsthand the changes that have been talked about so far on the panel, and have students here who were also really interested in it, so did joint research with students at Northwestern, um, mostly female. 
and mostly Muslim, and all from uh, either born or raised uh, in Qatar. And we wanted to see what was happening in the minds of young women, so we asked. So we did uh, research, uh, both in 2010 and in 2016, and we're hoping to repeat it here for the World Cup, asking young girls and women what inspired them in sport. And in particular, one of the questions that we asked had to do with the Qatari women who represented culture at the 2012 Olympics. There were four women, it was historic. They, you know, Qatar was very positive and wanted to send women to the Olympics, but had just not yet had a woman meet the qualifying standard. The closest was a uh, shooter, Fahia, who was 0.5 away from meeting the qualifying standard. When the International Olympic Committee offered wild cards to the three countries who had not yet sent women, Saudi, Brunei, and Qatar, they offered two wild cards. It basically means you can send who you want, even if they don't qualify. Qatar jumped at the opportunity and said, actually, can we send four? Saudi had to be forced to, and actually sent two expat women. There was a basic news blackout in the country, and Brunei was about the same. And so both of those countries only finally sent women because their men would not be allowed to compete unless they sent them. So there's a clear desire here to, to elevate women's sports, and it has existed since before, you know, since, as Daniel mentioned, since the early 2000s. But unfortunately, what we found was that although there's a lot of support behind women's sport, the women who had been elevated weren't functioning as role models yet. And so one of the questions about having a role model like Nadia, who is an amazing footballer, who also is Muslim and Afghani, will she inspire young women here? Well, there's a lot of belief that for some young women, she's likely to, because there's a lot of things about her, and she is just an absolutely amazing footballer, as I said. She's also been simultaneously completing a medical degree, qualified for, uh, to be a doctor in January. She's competed on uh, you know, multiple, three, four, kind of depends on how you count continents, but three or four, so she's played in the you know, US League, she's played in European, she's played the, she's amazing. So, Will she inspire young women? I think she'll inspire some, but I think that more important to the lived experience of women here are the people around them. And that's what our research showed. So our research showed that family and coaches, so what we call personal role models, the people that are surrounding women and girls and encouraging them to be sporty, encouraging them to be physically active, Husbands sometimes fulfill this role, mothers, fathers, friends, and coaches in the research that we did. And so I think that that's one of the really neat things about the culture change that's happening, is the more sport happens in the culture, the more there'll be role models in everyday life that enable women and encourage women to be more active. And I think that's probably going to be one of the bigger legacies than an amazing sports.